Hello for everyone, welcome back to another episode of Behind the Lava Lava. We are Fia Poco Samoan veterans who talk about topics surrounding the Samoan culture and life. I'm your host, Michael Tan, and here with me today are Spencer Harmon and Atimua Mingi. To listen in on the latest episodes, be sure to follow us and subscribe on all social media platforms, including YouTube and Spotify. I hope you enjoy this episode. Now let's get straight into it. Today's topic, we're, we're going to talk about food because the cast members here, we all love food. And we're going to talk about the Samoan food, or it may not be considered Samoan food, but it's the food that we grew up since we were little. We grew up eating. And I'm going to put this out to the crew. Man, I'm smiling because it's the, it brings back memory. But I don't know if this even falls in the category of Samoan food. My first memory is it's, it's our version of cereal. I don't know if you guys had it, but this is how we had cereal back home. And this, this was, uh, you know, those tin can. It used to come in tin cans. I don't know about nowadays, but it's called Masi Sao. It's like Samoan crackers. And then we would have that. My mom would put it in, in like either milk or tea. So we crush that up. She would mix it in like Lipton tea, you know, for 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 the morning. And then that that's that, that's the earliest I remember of having. <laughs> like like I said, it's funny because I don't know if it even falls in the category of Samoan food or, or whatnot. But I mean, I guess the crackers is used for like all sorts of variety of things from falafelavis. And here we are in the morning eating it as a, as a form of cereal. And I know I mentioned a couple of times in that poverty line, and I think this is majority of, well, I don't know how other families are, but this is my family. We, my mom kind of taking care of everything in the household. So that that's how we kind of ate cereal back in the day was either, or yeah, that was either rice with tea or milk with tea, milk with rice or, or tea with rice or crackers. And this cracker specifically is called, um, I forgot the name, but it's called Masi Sao. And it come, it used to come in these tin, tin little box. And I think in some it used to come in like a one hole, like it used to hold a dozen, just one whole shelves of, of crackers. She so used to crumble those up, throw it in some tea, call it a, call it a breakfast of champions. <laughs> It's it, it's the small things that matter. And that right there is one of the things that I enjoyed back when I was little. I'm, I'm alongside with you. I, uh, my family also did that. And we did it with sweet milk or sweet tea. And I enjoyed it. Sometimes they would make a huge pot and serve it among the family members. But that was, I consider that a delicacy and and yeah we we enjoyed it you, you mentioned poverty and when you when you don't have much you come up with ways to enjoy the food right you come up with ways to to enjoy and love the food the food that you eat because we're all foodies and you know we lo- we love food oh that's for sure you know it's funny because like when you we started talking about uh, that. See, I've never heard of that. Like what, what y'all are talking about. That's not a breakfast I ever had or that one that I'm familiar with. But like, I'm curious now. Like, I feel like I missed out. But that made me think of what I think my first Samoan food is, is that I tried. And I, I'm guessing this is Samoan food. I don't know for sure. I just know that's what me and the cousins grew up eating was uh, cocoa rice. Cocoa rice and specific, also just rice and milk like as a breakfast, like it was my favorite breakfast. It's like, you know, it's, I love pancakes and French toast. But when I was thinking like uh, something unique to us, it's like my mom would whip up cocoa rice. It'd be like a special breakfast. And uh, yeah, it was a favorite for me and the cousins and 29 Palm. And then every time that we had rice with dinner, I was excited because I knew that if we had leftover for the for breakfast the next day, we we're probably gonna get rice and milk. You know, just take the rice in the bowl dump some sugar on it, dump some milk on it. I don't know, like to me, that was that was one of my favorite things in the world. Yeah, cocoa, cocoa rice or cocoa Samoa is a bomb that brings back memories when I was little. 
and I was a, I was basically like Tarzan when I was little, and I, no one supervised me. And I remember this trip. We went up in the Maumanga, the mountains, where there's a lot of cocoa cocoa beans, and we would basically crack open the ripe cocoa the cocos and we get we get the beans and we build a fire and we get like a like a pan and we we basically roast the beans that's that's how the coco coco samoas are made is by roasting those coco beans so that brings a lot of memories back and uh my kids love the coco samo they call it coco samo <laughs> but it's the more of the adaptive version where they use the chocolate instead of the actual coco samo here in the u.s yeah i was just about to say uh coco samo or coco rice is not complete without the actual coco from uh, samo so i don't know spence if you had the coco samo when you was growing up but if if it was you had the real deal man the other one you mentioned you kind of mentioned pancake uh spence the other one is our version of you know it's that round pancake we have flat pancakes all over the world. In, in Samoa, we got round pancake. And not only round pancake, but man, we threw uh, my mom. Used, I, I always miss my mom because she cooked. Although that's the other uh, the conception, the men cook in Samoa. But in our household, you know, uh, so to speak, growing up, it was my mom. But she used to cut up some bananas, and especially the ripe, the really ripe bananas. Uh, we didn't get that store-bought bananas, but we got the misilukis. I don't know if you guys know what Misiluki is like, a, the smaller, it's the Samoan bananas. So I was going, going to sign more. So anyhow, she get those really ripe ones, mix it up. I don't know, till this day, she uh, still hasn't gave me her recipe for it, which I'm going to, now that we have this, we're talking about, I'm going to actually uh, talk to her about it. But she would mix it up and make some good round pancakes. And that's the go-to for majority of Samoans. I think they go to the market and they have those small mini uh, pancakes. Maybe I think it's 50 cents. For like a dozen, I don't know, I don't know about today, but when I was growing up, it was 25 cents to 50 cents, and was, you get like a dozen, put some hot coffee or hot coffee, and it's done deal, man. So yeah, round round pancakes. That's yeah. Weird. Speaking on speaking on those round pangi kekes, we call them pancakes. It's every Saturday mornings that my mom would chase me to the market to get those <laughs> those pancakes. They're they're actually round and they're deep fried and the outside is fried and the inside is very soft and sweet if, if you're in american samoa you would know that this is it tastes amazing with your morning tea so we actually did my mom did actually make the pancake like that was good but the thing is, is like i don't know if i remember her ever making it for breakfast like when mom prepared it for us and with growing up it was like she was serving it like a dessert like but yeah the pancake it was a bomb uh, and yeah we did have the coco samoa but when i was growing up it was a very rare thing so like we would write letters to the family back in alisa and we just keeping in touch with cousins and uncles and aunties and we would get excited because every few months every once in a while we would get a package in the mail from Samoa and we would geek out and just get excited about it because usually it had a little brick of cocoa Samoa in it. So typically with the cocoa rice, mom was making it with Hershey's. It wasn't the the, the real deal, but that's because it was hard to get the real cocoa Samoa. When we got the cocoa Samoa, it went into actually making the cocoa. And so that was one of those things where sometimes you've had it so many times and maybe you'll get tired of it over time. But with Coco Samoa, for me, it's like the older I've gotten, the more I've enjoyed Coco Samoa. Like I, I like it even more now than before. And when I finally had Coco rice with the Coco Samoa in it, I was like, oh, it's like a whole different level. It's like, it was, like you could tell the difference between the Coco Samoa version versus the, the one made with the Hershey's. It's like I enjoyed both, but made with the real Coco Samoa is another level. Now let's get into the 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 better fattening food, <laughs> I would like to call it, and these are the food that we serve in Kuangais. But I wanna I wanna speak on the fali falifu uh, fai. It can be the ulu or kalo. Ati, can you explain to our listeners today how you make the falifu? 
All right. Well, hey, the staple of all Samoan food is coconut milk. And the, the way to the Samoan men's heart is through coconut. So <laughs> I don't know how true and accurate that is, but I mean, that's the majority of our, our delicacies in Samoa is, uh, has to do with the coconut. And the coconut was readily available back in the day, you know, our old ancestors. I'm, I'm just speaking off, off the top of my head. I, don't, I really don't know. But I do know that uh, for falifu fa'i or falifu just means is the term for anything having coconut milk in there. So if you hear falifu fa'i, fa'i means banana, ulu means breadfruit in Samoan, kalo means taro. So those those three are the staple of Samoan uh, delicacy or delic- I want to say delicacy, but everyday uh, side dish that goes with any heavy meal that you have. It's kind of like eating eating something with rice. So having taro, having a banana on the side. So the way you cook it is you pretty much boil water. You throw your your uh, pai in there or banana or your and th- these are all ripe by the way. So you throw it in there, let it boil. Cook for maybe uh, maybe 10, uh, 5, 10, 10 minutes after boil, pull out the water. And then this is where, you know, you either you go uh, grab store-bought cook on your own or you go gonna throw in there. I would like to cut some onions, throw some onions in there, salt, pepper to taste. If you don't want, if you don't like pepper, don't put pepper in there. I, I don't know who puts pepper in there, in their in their falifu, but you just throw it in there, mix it up and you call it a day. That's called Fali Fufai, Fali Futaro, or Fali Fufulu. And, and not only that, not only Fali Fufu, you can also bake it. There's ton, tons of ways to make it. You can bake banana, bake ulu, bake taro. And uh, those are our easy way to, to get to the, the man's heart in the uh, inside. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, that's that's about it, boss. I don't know anything else. <laughs> yeah, and I want to point out the fact that you use a green banana. Don't use the ripe banana. Because it would it wouldn't taste right if you use a ripe banana. Use the green ones. And did I say ripe? Yeah, you said ripe. Okay, <laughs> not ripe. <laughs> yeah, so growing up, you know the shavings for the coconut after you squeeze out the coconut milk. When I was little, I used those coconut shavings and I mixed it in with a uh, sugar. So you kinda sh- fry the sugar in a frying pan and you basically turn it into caramel right and then you put in those coconut shavings and it becomes a almost like a candy a salmon candy so it's basically uh coconut shavings with caramel or caramel so that was one of the the candies that i ate when i was little yeah, that, that caramel, caramel, whatever word, how you pronounce that word, you can make it through burning burning sugar or heating sugar on the on the stove. Now, if it gets too well done, then that's where it gets a little bit toxic. Evident of um, one day, it was me and my brother, we were trying to mix them, and it got to the point where it was getting too, I don't know, there's a point where if you go beyond it, the sugar doesn't, it doesn't taste good. And so we were just doing and mixing it up. Just like how you said, after you uh, you get those, it's called bingu, bingu, the coconut shavings. So, and you, you mix it with sugar, cook it, you try to get that caramel candy taste. Man, we messed it up. We went beyond that because usually we don't make it because mom, of course, makes it. So we were trying to make it, mix it up, we bit into it, man. I don't know, we, we spit that thing fast and fast. I mean, like it was... I don't know, my, my brother, he, he almost passed out because <laughs> he was still eating it, thinking that it was good. But man, little did we know we was eating something toxic. So shit, I'm glad I'm alive, but I, that was, those were the days. Because <laughs> when the last time I was actually on the island, I was four years old. So I have like, I, I do have some good memories of back then, but you know, memories from when you're four, it's like things aren't as clear as they used to, but the food's definitely one of those things I remember. It's like even when we were talking earlier about just the prep and whatnot, it just, but I was a four-year-old and so I would just be watching my uncles cook or watching my, my grandma and, or my aunties cook, like usually in the, the backyard or something. It's like, it's just, I still remember that, but I was just a little four-year-old. I just remember at the time, me and my brother and my cousin, no, so like we're just running around. And I remember our thing was we'd go up to the fire where they're prepping the food. And we'd just be putting sticks in the fire and then trying to poke each other with the hot end. So it's like, as far as I, didn't, I wasn't learning much from the food prep, but 
Yeah, I remember. I remember for a long time, father and my mom, after we came back to the States, asking if we could have palusami because I just remembered how good it was. And like, we, we, we would make palusami every once in a while stateside, but usually that's like a graduation or a wedding or some, a special occasion. But I just remembered missing that food a lot when we came back to the States. So, Ati, can you explain to our listeners what palusami is? <laughs> is that like, yeah. I, like, I like the way you explain it. All right, I'll try my best, but so, yeah, you need uh, your show. You need a show for just this because you're good at explaining this. <laughs> but that's funny, uh, man. Palusami is one of those rare delicacies in Samoa, and I could say for a fact that is one of the, our own dishes. Now, how do I know this? Well, because I made it many times. Uh, I could count on, uh, I don't know, uh, it's more more than a dozen times. I, I don't know, a hundred, over a hundred times. Anyhow, so the, like I said again, number one staple ingredient is coconut. If you have coconut, you can make uh, palusami. And palusami, all it is, is you get, you got tons of taro leaves, baby taro leaves, you know, right as soon as they're baby, baby taro leaves, okay? And then you, you take the biggest taro leaf, you put it on the outside, and then you fill all the middle with all different types of medium, small, or baby taro leaves, baby taro leaves towards the, the middle. <laughs> now, to avoid that scratchy itchiness that sometimes people get when they have taro, they say cook the taro leaves first, but what me and, uh, well, I was taught, just everything is handed down from, from the, this is from my dad now. The ends, the tip of the taro leaves, you, you take that off, and then the stems, you kind of shave the stems off or take the stems off entirely. And then the back of the taro leaf, you you take off the, the stem because the stem is, is I think that's the, the, the portion where it, where the leaves has it's that toxic or that toxic that causes that itchiness when you're when you're eating it. So anyhow, you put it in there, you throw your, your coconut milk in there, kind of trying to create like a like a bowl with it, and then close it up. And then you could just surround it up and then just use one of those stems to tie it up and then add the foil on the outside and cook it for say about 30 to 45 minutes to one hour, depending on uh, if you really want it really well done or, you know, right in between well done and rare. There's a level to it too, just like steak. So <laughs> we usually do it for about 40 minutes. That's why I think that's the sweet spot. I don't know about the other other people out there that might be listening, you know, thinking it might be 30 or you could argue with me all about it. That's, that's how we, I was taught. That's how my dad said, because we cooked it through the, the umu, and umu usually goes about about an hour, and we would have the the palusami right right below the the cover. If you understand how the umu works, there's an outside covering. There's tons of layers for the for the umu, so we put it right before, and then we could take that off, take the palusamis off, and let the rest of the, the other foods being cooked cook. All right, so I, I hope I got the message across. <laughs> but that's that's palusami in a gif. Yeah, and to our listeners, the uh, umu is 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 a ground pit it's not underground it's, it just sits on top of the ground and it's made of hot hot rocks and the food is placed on those hot rocks and covered with like banana leaves or some people just wet like huge rugs and boxes and placing it on top of the, the food to contain the heat and there are certain every family has their own way of making the palusami you know you add onions some people they add meat i know the tongans have their own version of the palusami they call it the lucipi where they add lamb and that's that's one of my favorites is the the lucipi when they add lamb or or the pisupo to it Two things that you brought up. I want, I want to talk about Pisupo, but on the subject of umus, is like we had, even in the 29 Palms, that's another one of my favorite memories was my uncle Taia, he, he he raised pigs. And so like the Funga family, he raised pigs. And so that was a regular thing where every once in a while, like butcher the pig. And I just remember sitting there, once again, as me being a little kid, I'm just kind of playing around, not really helping, but I, I liked actually like watching and, like just hanging out with the men as they're prepping it. Uncle Taya would butcher a pig every once in a while. I'd just be there for every step of the way. And sometimes we we would cook it there at the Funga household, if I remember right. But we also had a umu at our house. So like with 29 Palms on our Amboy Road, we had one of those desert dwelling houses, but we had a concrete pit 
that we had dug out. We did line that with the coals and we'd like have the, the fire and everything. But since we didn't have no banana leaves, we would actually cover the pig with the pig on the coals, but we'd cover everything with newspaper. We'd use newspaper, but uh, that was, yeah, it was legit. It was good. It made good pig. But on the subject of bisupo, it was like, that's one of my favorite comfort foods. And so my favorite memory with bisupo is uh, when I went to Afghanistan on my, my second tour in Afghanistan, I'm just uh, chilling in my little bee hut. You know, I got a care package from home. I had some candies and some crackers and stuff in there. And I got a few cans of pisupo and I didn't have nothing to cook it with. And I was like, well, you know, it's good to eat right out of the can. I just wanted it hot. So I just remembered I had a little lamp that I had on my desk. And so I took my lamp and I just pulled the bulb down, like all the way down. I opened the can, had it there and pulled the bulb down to just get the heat of the lamp to like warm up my pea soup bowl. And while it was doing that, I went to the DFAC and got just a small to-go tray with rice and a little bit of vegetables. So that way I came back, my pea soup bowl was warm. It's like lukewarm pea soup bowl. I just dumped it all on and ate it with the rice. It was like the best pea soup bowl I, I remembered having just because it's just that legit comfort food. So the, the pea soup bowl that Spencer is talking about is corned beef. And it's not your regular Walmart corned beef. I'm talking about the corned beef from Australia or New Zealand. And this is a special type of corned beef. And it's very fatty and delicious. <laughs> and that's why our people love it very, very much. And my favorite way of cooking pea soup is saute the onions. And then you throw in the pea soup. Make sure it's in little chunks. And then you throw in the spaghetti. That's my favorite way of cooking the pea soup with spaghetti and and I could eat that all day with rice. Uh, hey, it's funny you guys mentioned pea soup because you know it's one of those things where man, is this is is this Samoan food or not Samoan food? But you know, it's Samoan food when when we prepare it the way we like it. And I think that goes to speak for a majority of Samoan food, especially when we cook it through the umu. And it's not so much the taste of the food, but it's the experience and the concept of going into preparation or preparing the food. You know, there's tons of things going on. And, you know, there's, you have two or three, four guys sitting around joking and, you know, it takes about maybe three, four hours prepping the, for the umu and then maybe an hour just to cook the food. But going back on the pea soup bowl, the way I like to make pea soup bowl is just the basic way. I don't really use oil anymore because I used to have, you know, add oil in there, but I figured pea soup already has, it's fatty enough. So throw pea soup in there, cut onions up, throw it, well, onions first, you know, but, um, you know, I use the the fat from the pea soup, mix it up, peppers in there or, um, you know, ground pepper. And then just, that's it, base, that's the base level. I used to like adding all the other stuff when I was growing up, you know, like you mentioned uh, spaghetti, you know, corn was the other one. And I know uh, the other way it was made was, uh, it's called skew. I don't know if you guys have ever skew before, but that's where uh, you add, you know, a little bit of flour, try to make it into like a little gravy and then eat it with the pea soup. But I like the bare minimum base way of how to make pea soup and that's just onions and pea soup by itself. As you mentioned, rice, I love it with rice, man. Nothing can go wrong with rice, but if you have a uh, kalo, I'll eat pizza with kalo any day. No, it's funny how you, you mentioned gravy because my mom, there's a certain way that she cooks gravy and she puts it on the food and, and I, I can't seem to mimic how or copy how she cooks gravy because it's, it's a certain way and it's complicated to me. Cause she adds flour and all this other stuff, but it, it just, it brings back a lot of childhood memories, especially gravy cooking from scratch. My, my mom, I, I do miss her cooking on gravy. I need to get a recipe that reminds me, but I wish I had a recipe to cook so I could like pass it to my kids or something. Well, hey. I'll, I'll give you a hint, man. Here's the secret. The secret is my mom told me you gotta burn, you gotta burn the uh, uh, the flour maca or flour. You gotta burn it, uh, and to burn that, you know, it's through the the oil. So 
whatever burning process she's talking about, and I'm the same way. I can't imitate it because she says you gotta burn the burn the flour maca or, or a flour, and that's how you get that that authentic Samoan gravy that you know our mom cook. The other most important delicacy that I think it comes every once once in a year, and I think Dan, you knows I don't know Spence if you had this, but it's it's that uh palolo that warm that sea warm that comes once a year usually around this time. August, well, actually, no, around September, October time frame. And that delicacy right there is one of those things that I think a lot of Samoans fight over, especially territories where they, they would go uh, get the, the palolo, because the palolo, like I say, it only comes once a year and it only comes, and you, we don't really know if it comes on a Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, but we do know it comes like around October or September time frame. And the way I like that, that made is just cooking it with butter. That's it. Cooking it with butter. That's the way my dad likes it. And and when I when he made it the first time and I ate it, that's the way I, I go with that right now. That with butter and onions. I don't know about you guys if you ever had pololo, but uh, man, that's what if you're a more and you've never had had pololo, you need to you need to taste that pololo, man. Hey, I, I don't I don't think I know what that is. So wait, so what is it? What is it? So it's 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 basically almost like tiny sea worms that spawn every i don't know how many times a year they spawn but usually around october just once just one time yeah and they they come from the coral reefs up to the surface and and you'll see the whole village go out there with buckets and nets and try to gather these and then they'll either keep some for their, themselves and sell it at a ridiculous price to other people but i forgot the english word for palolo but i'm sure if you look Palolo, P A L O L O. You'll yeah. find mm -hmm. what we're talking about, but it's it's they're just worms spawning from the ocean, and it's it's an acquired taste because it does taste salty, like it's the sea salty. <laughs> it's a hard thing to describe. I just want to say this: Palolo is just. I think we're the. Only, I don't know about any other islanders. So I don't know about Fiji, Tonga, whatever. But I know it only comes here in American Samoa or Samoan shores. That's where, even in Hawaii, they don't have it in Hawaii. And um, it, they probably exist, but I don't know if the Hawaiians or anybody figured it, you know, how to get it. But the way we catch is we use those nets that, uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because uh, we used to use these, uh, it's called the screens, the, the cover of the windows. You know, just during this time, around that time, we, we would break those or take those off and we just run to the ocean and just use that to, to catch the, the pololos. And then, you know, come and you get a big a big whooping for breaking the, the screen off the window. But that's how it was. You know, you don't know when it comes. So that's why you, you got to be ready 24-7 when it, when it comes. You got to be out there, get as much as you can, or else you're going to end up buying ridiculous amounts like what Tan was saying, like 500. People will sell it up to five, almost a thousand at one point, I think. So yeah, really good, really tasty, acquired taste, so to speak. Thank you for tuning into our episode. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. Please share your experience with us or even suggest a topic you would like us to talk about. Do faso y fuo.